one night I was the golden girl, triple Olympic gold medalist, and then wake up the next morning to be the worst person in the entire world. It just happened like that. You devote your whole life into that club and then all of a sudden they just take it away from you and you're thinking, what have I done wrong? Everything just stops. One of my good friends from America, one of my teammates said to me, you know, they say athletes die two times, you know, and it's true. I go to bed and my goal was to get through the day to make breakfast tomorrow. And I remember, yeah, at times you just sit there and you think, I, I felt a failure. Welcome to Four Corners. In Sports Mad Australia, we love to share the triumphs and heartbreaks of our elite athletes on the football field, the cricket pitch or in the swimming pool. The national obsession with winning has prompted governments and sporting bodies to pump public funds into the careers of young people who show promise. But unless they fall into scandal, we hear little about our champions once they're forced to give the game away. Often they don't do so on their own terms, and that's when they can find themselves overwhelmed. The suicide of rugby great Daniel Vickerman this year has prompted more athletes to speak out about life after the game. Tonight, some of our former superstars tell us how leaving sport created a dangerous vacuum in their lives and urge sporting bodies to do much more to prepare elite athletes for the fall. Louise Milligan reports. Nothing like a stadium, walking out onto the playing arena, people cheering for your team, cheering your teammates for the excellence that they produce. The moment you get told that you can't play rugby anymore, it's like the light goes out. It's all gone. You're a former player. The spotlight that shines so brightly and sometimes can be blinding gets turned off and you effectively feel like you're in the dark. Daniel Joseph Vickerman was born in South Africa. He moved to Australia at the turn of the millennium. Goes to Vickerman, the money man. Dan's style of play was exactly what you wanted. It's what I loved. It's, you know, it was confrontational. It was in your face. He was a, a, a physical, aggressive, you know, no holes barred player. You always knew from a coaching point of view that with Dan in the team, you were not going to have to question physicality. It just came with Dan. Dan Vickerman, he takes it with two hands. On the rugby field, he used his enormous height and heft to devastating effect. Now it's Vickerman, up over halfway. Good beaters here by the Wallabies. I'm sure there's international rugby players that would have been shuddering around the grounds knowing that Vicks was coming to clean them out. What a tackle from Ian Goff. After 10 years playing at the peak of his sport, Rugby Union, Vickerman retired from the Wallabies due to injury. He studied at Cambridge University and built a career in finance. In short, he seemed like the ultimate success story for life after sport. He was just a big, beautiful guy. He sadly never saw himself the way others did. In February this year, five years after his retirement and struggling with mental illness, Daniel Vickerman took his own life. There was no obvious indicators that you know, what was to happen was going to happen. The Saturday that it happened, it was a really normal day. Been to basketball with his little boy in the morning. Went to the beach that afternoon, you know, and had a family dinner that night where they went out and everything was you know, there was nothing untoward. May he rest in peace. Vickerman's death shocked the sporting world. It was just disbelief. Just utter disbelief. When, you know, a good mate of yours, you find out they've passed away, you, you almost feel a little bit of guilt about, you know, was I a good enough mate? Did I ask the right questions? And you obviously straight away think, no, you didn't. Daniel Vickerman left behind a wife and two young boys. I stand before you today on behalf of two families in grief and given Dan's significant achievements, I think it's safe to say as well, an entire world that is in shock. 
Brendan Cannon was Dan Vickerman's rugby roommate and his dear friend. I think it's just such a tragedy that our much loved mate felt so alone at that moment to, to, to do what he did. Vickerman had struggled with debilitating depression. He had been diagnosed with a mental illness and prescribed medication. He had told friends it had been exacerbated by coming to terms with life after rugby. A lot of his conversations were around the fact that you go from being a certain type of person one day, the centre of attention, highly supported, highly frameworked and structured in terms of what you were doing and the feedback you got to being completely left on your own the next. And I think for many people in the general population that can seem a little bit precious and a lot of people th seem to think, oh, well, it can't be that bad, you were doing what you loved as a, as a job. Um, suck it up. Yeah, suck it up. And um, the difficulty is, you know, I think for athletes, a lot of that journey is all they know. And Dan spoke of that feeling of kind of abandonment in the sense that um, so much was done for me when I was playing, then um, now I feel that no one could be bothered kind of calling to see how I'm going. All of us at different times have had really dark periods post-football and Dan was no exception really. He had dark periods away from football in his transition and we rallied around him, you know, a couple of times and we thought that we'd managed to navigate him out of the darker periods. Let's go back five, throw him in. In the tight-knit world of Australian rugby, Vickerman's death has opened a wound for the men he played with. Crouch. It's prompted them to speak up about what has remained until now largely unsaid. One, two. I think my generation of rugby players are probably very good at holding their cards close to their chest. It's you know, that generation of men that you know, uh, bottle it up and man up and be tough. Don't talk about your issues or your problems. It's a theme that, across Australia and internationally, sporting bodies are grappling with. How to prepare elite athletes for the crash so many suffer when the game's over. You definitely can't replicate the adrenaline and, and the feel and the buzz you get out of playing professional sport. You go from running out onto a stadium with 116,000 people watching and feeling the hairs on the back of your neck rise and singing the national anthem and, and getting a real you know, pumped up feeling and you know, then you retire, the only time you sing the national anthem is, is when you go to a school assembly for your kids. You go from being the king of your domain, where you know exactly what your value is, what your job is, the influence you can have on your teammates, that type of thing. And then all of a sudden, you're standing on your own in a room full of strangers, which are your new work friends, and they're wanting to talk to you about what you used to be, and all you want to focus on is what you want to become. And you're very un unsure as to who you are. If there's any sport that captures the Australian public's imagination, it's swimming. I think it's a feeling like no other to be in the water, this feeling like you can't really be touched. The highs are incredible and that feeling doesn't get replicated in day-to-day -day life. The elation you feel when you finish the wall knowing that you've either won or you've done the best that you can is just something that you can't describe. But the steady procession of swimmers who have very publicly lost their way draws into sharp relief the difficulties athletes face after retirement. The perception in my mind was everything else will be downhill from here. I've just reached the pinnacle. This is my lifelong dream. So is everything else here, like, downhill? It's a fast time. She's dragging Megan Nay along with her. 
Belinda Hocking used to be the best backstroker in the world. What about this from Belinda Hocking? Just fantastic. She it's went to three so Olympics Belinda Hocking. and won gold at the Commonwealth Games. But she's gone from sporting glory to a job hunt that's lasted six months. Recently, she found herself queuing up at Centrelink. I walked in there and they said, well, what have you done? And I said, I'm a triple Olympian, I've been swimming. And they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. And you go from five minutes of people saying, that's amazing, you've had such an incredible journey, or I wish I had have been to an Olympics. And they're more employable than what I am. You put on the top of your resume, triple Olympian, dual Commonwealth Games gold medalist, and I still haven't heard back from 10 jobs that I've applied for. I've been told numerous times of lack of experience, and how was I meant to get that experience when what I was doing was being an elite athlete? Belinda Hocking even struck out when she applied for an admin job at Swimming Australia. I'm not upset at the organisation for that, but makes me feel pretty shit about my life because if I can't get a job at the organisation that I've been a part of for 13 years, it doesn't really hold much hope for the rest of my career opportunities. Um, it's been really hard, I'm sorry. Um, you go from something that you're the best in the world at, um, and I can happily say that I was the best at the world um, at what I did. and. You've got a lot of people around you saying that the skills that you have are transferable and that you'll get a job quite easily. Um, and that hasn't happened. It's been, it's been really hard. Put the name in lights. Stephanie Rice breaks the world record. Everything that I knew about myself and prided myself on, my confidence, came from swimming. Look out, Beijing. Here comes Stephanie. So take away the vehicle that gave me all of those, um, all of those feelings and all of that pride and confidence. It was like, who is Stephanie Rice? Because um, I only knew Stephanie Rice, the swimmer. She's going to get another world record. After she smashed world records and won three gold medals at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, Stephanie Rice was the ultimate swimming superstar. Stephanie Rice, you are a sensation. One night I was the golden girl, triple Olympic gold medalist, and then like wake up the next morning to be the worst person in the entire world. Stephanie Rice's teammates have described a homophobic slur she made on Twitter as out of character. Stephanie Rice's fall from grace began when a stupid tweet in which she used the word faggots went viral. The offensive comment was removed late yesterday. Actually, it was my mum that was like, do you know what faggot means? And I was like, no. Like, I just didn't. And so then she had to explain her generation what it was like. And then I was like, OK, I, have, I understand how it's been received now. And I was copying 500 messages or more a day of just complete hate. And, OK, how do I, how do I get through this? Because I liked all the good stuff, but I'm not really prepared for all the bad stuff. I, th I just really owe it to every everyone to apologise for what's happened. And I want people to know how sorry I am for what's happened. Rice never recovered her former Olympic glory. She was dogged by injury, and she was bitterly disappointed at her final games in London. I think I've done absolutely everything that I could have done. It's been really tough. She fell into a slump after the Games and felt a failure. Just a long slog of being at the bottom and not seeing any light at the end of the tunnel. And that lasted for at least two years. Stephanie Rice's good friend is Grant Hackett. We'll talk about that in due course. Hackett has been in rehab after spectacularly going off the rails. Rice isn't surprised at how many athletes go down this path. You are now in this position of being 25 to 30 and having no clue 
what you're going to do with the next 50 years of your life. And all your peers and everyone else around you has already gone through that when they were, you know, 17, 18 at uni, figuring it out, and now they're in their journey. They're, like, working to be a doctor or, or whatever. And you're like, I have no idea what I want to do. And so that was brutal because you just get robbed of everything that you believe that you are and figure out that it was all external. It was all based on other people giving me the confidence, not actually being confident inside. Start off with lunges. Make sure that your knees don't track over your ankles. Stephanie Rice has now come out the other side. Really feel the burn in the bum. She's a businesswoman who designs swimwear and promotes health and fitness products. But Belinda Hocking is still finding her feet. We put these athletes up on these pedestals and we want their autographs and we want their signatures and we want every little piece of them while they're being an athlete. But as soon as they're not that athlete, we don't care. If you were someone who had an underlying mental health problem, how do you think you would cope with that? I'd want to hurt myself. I, I think I'd definitely um, want to hurt myself um, because there was a time uh, a couple of weeks ago I didn't want to leave the house. I, I didn't want to see anyone. I, I didn't want people to see me um, because I was so sick of people asking me what I was doing and asking me if I'm OK. And for someone that's been all over the world to then someone that doesn't want to leave their house... Um, something's wrong. Something's wrong. In the Olympian community alone, there's over 100 who've committed suicide, and that's including gold medalists. You know, um, it's not just people who, who haven't made it in the sport or struggled, it's, it's people who've been absolute stars in the sport who've struggled. <laughs> Hawking is doing a degree in teaching and classes in animal studies. Several weeks after we met her, she got a part-time job as a medical receptionist. I am optimistic and I'm upbeat. I think you have to be. It was a pretty bad week last week. There was lots of crying and not knowing what I'm going to do, but I think you just have to look towards the future and, you know, hope one day that you'll wake up knowing what you want to do. I think all of us involved in the sport could put our hands on our hearts and say, listen, we weren't doing enough to prepare our swimmers for, for life away from the pool, and, and that's something that's been addressed. The Peak Body Swimming Australia has put in place some programs to support athletes' wellbeing and to prepare them for life out of the pool. It needs to start earlier and it needs to not be seen as a detriment to performance, but actually as an enhancement to performance. I think that's why it's really important that we start educating these kids at a younger level that whilst their hopes and dreams are to represent their country, don't expect to make a living out of it so you can buy a house. Prepare yourself so that you can get a job so that you can then afford to pay a mortgage to put food on the table. They're the types of things we need to be discussing. Olympian Garo Tawi runs Crossing the Line, an organisation which supports retiring athletes. There's a very simple question in all this. It's, if, you're not, if you can't do your sport tomorrow, what can you do? Because at the moment, you know, athletes, are, you know, they're competing for maybe 10 years if they're lucky, uh, 10 years out of an 80-year life. At the moment, that 10 years, for a lot of people, it's destroying the rest of their lives. It's, just, it's actually destroying the next 60. When you're honest, it's like you're in cruise control and you can see everything. You know what's happening, you know what they're thinking, you almost feel like you're playing the game one step ahead. It's a massive adrenaline rush. And then it goes. I've pretty much come to terms that I'm not going to get that ever again. Nathan Bracken was once the world's top one-day bowler. 
Now he's in a family business that lays asphalt. I work for my father-in-law and he gives me the utmost respect 24-7. I went into an industry that I really knew very little about and he's taught me from the ground up. A new test career was born when paceman Nathan Bracken became the 387th player to be honoured with the baggy green. For Nathan Bracken, becoming a professional cricketer was always a childhood dream. Oh, he's got him, he's bowled him out. It's a fairy tale. It's probably more than you ever wish for. As a kid, you sit there and it's what you want to do and, oh, how great would this be? And all of a sudden you're in the position where it's just, it's bigger and better than you can imagine. Got, got him. The lanky lad with the distinctive blonde mop became a ferociously gifted fast bowler. He's a great one-day bowler. He's got brilliant stats. Um, Nathan's always done well for the Australian cricket team. Make sure we've got plenty of moisture before we start sweeping. Nathan Bracken was forced to retire in 2011. His father-in-law gave him the job because he simply couldn't get other work. Thank you, Nathan. Dashboard there. Yeah. I applied for pretty much every job under the sun. I applied for packing shelves in shopping centres. And the comments said, oh, what do you need a job for? Oh, you don't need this. Oh, don't be silly. Oh, I had a sponsor who said, mate, apply for the job. Done. And the, um, the manager from their um, head office rang up and said, oh, mate, said, you're going up against 22-year-old kids. You're 32. Bracken's career began to unravel when he was injured in 2006. As you can see there at the bottom, that's a cross-section of the knee. And so what is it? What, what is that damage? What has you done? Uh, torn the cartilage. And then from there, it sort of continued. December was when it really got bad. And it was in the middle of a 19 over spell and, and getting towards the back end of, of that spell, the knee started to get sore. I felt a grab. So did you know at that point that that was the beginning of the end for you? No. I just thought, oh, well, it's, it's something. Get it fixed and, and life goes forward. From then on, until his retirement, his knee progressively got worse. Basically, what he was told was, it's bone bruising, it will get better. Um, he fought to get scans. Um, he was given prescription medication um, just to mask it. Um, and he played with that injury to the point where he couldn't straighten his knee any longer. His wife, Hayley, watched her husband's decline. There were times where Nathan would wake up in the morning and he couldn't walk. So he would hobble around like he was 80, 90. And um, I was scared. I'd say to him, you've got to say something, you've got to do something. And he'd respond and say, I am. I am saying there's something wrong, but I'm, I'm not getting anywhere. With the backing of Cricket Australia, Bracken played on through three operations and years of rehab until he could simply play no more. It's with great regret that I have to announce. <sighs> it was a lot easier last night when I practiced this. Um, that I will be retiring from all forms of cricket effectively immediately. Bracken went to see Cricket Australia to ask what it had in place for players forced to retire because of injury. So he went to meet with them just to see if they could cover the medical costs. And the term they used, or the, the words that they used was, if you want anything from us, you have to sue us. There's no system in place to take care of players that have career ending injuries. It's short and sharp. See you later. Thanks for coming. This is Dancing with the Stars. Cricket hero Nathan Bracken. Floundering and worried about money, the Brackens accepted an invitation to go on the reality TV show Dancing with the Stars. Nathan and Hayley Bracken, the first ever married couple to compete on Dancing with the Stars. She drives me crazy. She gives me hot and cold but Bracken, still struggling with the injury, was booted out at first opportunity. The first couple to leave Dancing with the Stars for 2011 is Nathan and Marsha. I went into it with the approach of, I want to achieve something. I don't want to feel useless and worthless anymore. I want to achieve something. It didn't work. I came out of that 
probably worse than when I went in. I felt like I was a failure again. That I couldn't, I couldn't achieve anything. I couldn't do basic things. By then, Nathan Bracken could barely leave the house. Some of the goals I was setting were so trivial. What sort of goals? Making breakfast. So I go to bed and my goal was to, to get through the day to making breakfast tomorrow. And that's it, and that's where it's at. And, and I remember, yeah, at times you just sit there and you think, I, I felt a failure. I, I went from I could provide for my family um, to all of a sudden days where, yeah, I couldn't. My wife's been amazing. And to be honest, probably without her and my two boys, it would be a very, very different story. Nathan Bracken decided to sue Cricket Australia and its doctors for negligence. Ultimately, what it came down to was we had no option. He lost his contract, he was injured, we had no future prospects. We didn't know how much the medical bills would be, we didn't know what we were facing. Cricket Australia denied negligence and fought his claim. The case settled confidentially. Oh. Cricket Australia tout themselves as a, a family-friendly game. But what they put my family through, it's shocking. Yeah. It took five years. The case went for five years. So that's an indication of, of how vigorously it was defended. Cricket Australia declined to be interviewed for this program and said it could not discuss Bracken's case. In a statement, it said cricketers are provided with payments for two years after an injury, but that's only for players on contract. Those who have retired after an injury are only paid excess medical expenses, and there is no workplace compensation scheme for cricketers or many other athletes around the country. It is very, very hard on the body, and you will walk away at the end of your career with niggles and a lot of aches and a lot of pains and in some cases you'll have injuries that will you know follow you for the rest of your life but that's part and parcel of playing sport you know you get the good remuneration you get the good returns financially for putting your body on the line cricketers decided to help themselves by setting up a fund to support past players when the australian cricket association was formed geez 20 years ago there was nothing in place for players, not only from a professional, for, for a current playing players, but also for past players. So it's only within the last four years that the past player welfare program has really developed and that's grown significantly. And those funds are actually coming from the current playing group. Nathan Bracken says he's on the road to accepting his new life. The thing is, I'm out the other side. And like doing things like this, it's not about me. Sitting here and saying this and going through all this, it's not helping me. But if it can change it for somebody else coming out of the game, if there's something in place that can help these men and women coming out, then me, I'll sit and do this all day. They look at us as indestructible, fit, strong, built blokes that can take anything. But realistically, it's not so much the body, it's the mind that, that it takes over, which is the hardest part to try and mend. Courtney Dempsey used to run on to the MCG in front of 100,000 football fans. Now he's playing footy for the Greenvale Jets, a suburban club on Melbourne's northwestern outskirts. Dempsey was delisted from the big league, the Essendon Football Club, at the end of last year. The coach called me in and just said, oh, your services aren't needed next year and... Um... Like everyone says, it comes with the territory and it's a cutthroat industry, um, professional sports, and um, you know, no one really cares about your well-being and, and what you do uh, anyways, but you know, a lot of people forget that we're still human beings. Dempsey was a teenager from an Indigenous community in North Queensland 
when he was picked up by an Essendon scout. <laughs> My manager rang me up and goes, oh, congratulations, you got drafted to Essendon. It's like, oh, cool, thanks, where's that? And, you know, he sort of laughed at me and, and said, no, oh, mate, you're moving down to Melbourne. Tipsy, how bold was that? Look at him charging through, he lost it, he kept on going. He played defence for the Bombers for a decade. Oh, you're Over kidding. the top, look at Straight back to it. it breaks dry. <laughs> That's magical. The dream turned sour. The Bombers became embroiled in a scandal over the club's supplements regime. Dempsey was one of the few who didn't take the peptides. I don't like needles, actually. I don't like any needles now. So, you know, it, it, it was probably um, the best thing, dodging the, the biggest bullet that you can ever, ever dodge. But after living through the turmoil for three years, Dempsey was told he was dropped during a 15-minute meeting with his coach. You devote your whole life into that club and then all of a sudden they just take it away from you and you're thinking, well, what have I done wrong? I've done everything that you've asked me to do and yet you still throw this at me. I do feel uh, bitter, like a piece of meat, you know, just um, getting thrown around and um, forgotten about once, you, once, you, once they know you, you're done. A lot of the time, players are not finishing on their terms and feel they could play longer, and, you know, that process can be confronting. And meeting with your senior coach to say that we're not going to extend your contract is a challenging one. And, you know, with Courtney, I know since he's delisting our player development manager, I've met with him three or four times. I've met with him a couple of times to try and help with that, that, that transition, and we'll continue to do that. The challenge for Courtney Dempsey, like so many other athletes, is that he's never done anything else. I've been stuck in this regime for 11 years, 12 years, most of my life, and all of a sudden I've got to go out into the, the wider world and fend for myself, which I don't have a clue about because I've went from school straight into football, and all I know is football. Dempsey hit rock bottom. His family were very concerned. They kept half of me about seeing someone, saying, you know, I've got some form of depression, uh, and I, I thought, Nah, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm just upset about, you know, being delisted and, and finishing not on my merits. Uh, so, you know, and I, and I still say that to the to this day that I wasn't, um, that I was fine. And and um, but then when I slowly go over it and and look at it, you can you can tell that, you know, a lot of it was um, probably depression, and 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 a lot of my family were were right about it. We can all cast our minds back from 18 to 30. Pretty much what happens in those times is very important for the rest of your life. And it's a time that AFL players are in a bubble where they're treated as superheroes and they get an impression of themselves in the world that's just so far from reality. Unfortunately, we tend to deal with effects rather than causes. So we only wait to hear of the terrible um, stories we hear of players not coping with life after football and, and some of the circumstances around that before we start doing anything. Don't turn your back, Muzz, don't turn your back. You can actually tell when he's gonna go, short or long. For Sydney Swans coach, John Longmire, the focus is trying to identify and head off problems long before players retire. The club's hired an in-house clinical psychologist to work with players on their mental health rather than simply addressing their performance. Tippo, Tippo, who has a car? There's no point talking about performance if the person's not feeling right in themselves and it just seems like a common sense approach to be able to treat the, the clinical part of it rather than the performance part of it first. Because if you did it the other way around, um, I'm not sure you'd get the right result. Give me some space. In 2015, Longmire gave star player Lance Buddy Franklin several months off to manage his mental health and epilepsy. It's not just about one player here. It's hopefully allowing the opportunity for people and players to talk about it and not be judged, that's the most important thing. I think the AFL can do a lot more work 
They have psychologists and psychiatrists and the like in place, but in my mind, that's not dealing with the causes, it's dealing with the effects. Hi, guys. Hi. Former St Kilda coach Grant Thomas believes the more professional sport has become, the more removed athletes are from reality. He believes compulsory training and education is vital. We send kids in secondary school to do work experience. Why can't you send AFL players to do work experience? Are they, are they above that? Uh, um, don't they want to know what they want to do when, if, they, if they, their career collapses on them? Uh, do they know what industry they want to work in? Do they know what their skills are? At Essendon, they've brought in programs to try to address this problem. Particularly in their first four years, their development years as a player, the financial literacy, organisation skills, coping with resilience and general coping skills, full stop. A lot of that is mandatory. And then beyond that, it comes into much more tailored programs around specific areas of interest for players. Courtney Dempsey is still finding his way. He wants to build a profile working with the Indigenous community. Great to meet you. He's engaged a social media company to help him achieve this. OK, Courtney, so what we're going to do today is we're going to cover a social media campaign. I know that you've got a speaking gig up and coming. Recently, he found a job recruiting and managing Indigenous security guards and cleaners. You're out there helping the community. My competitiveness will probably come out in this and I want to develop and actually get somewhere in what I'm doing now, so be the best at what I'm doing now and, and hopefully that will come about sooner rather than later. As a young athlete, all you think is of is the now. You're on an island, you're on your own. For your whole entire life, you've been told you're the best, you're the greatest, you're doing this, you're doing that, and then all of a sudden, there's no one there. Everything, it just sort of stops, like everything just stops. One of my good friends from America, one of my teammates said to me, you know, they say athletes die two times. You know, and it's true, once your career's over, you, you've got to recreate yourself in a way that n other people don't really have to. Jackson from Rage. Lauren Jackson didn't think about that when she was quite literally at the top of her game. Best tournament of her life. And look at the emotions. Lauren's an absolute superstar as a sports person, but also as a person. I think she's delivered outcomes for basketball in Australia that will be probably never surpassed. For Jackson, the dream started when a four-year-old beanpole from the New South Wales town of Albury started shooting hoops. At a touch under two metres tall, she moved to the Institute of Sport at 15, then went on to play for Seattle Storm in America. For the second time in five years, Lauren Jackson's been named the most valuable player in the WNBA. Lauren was pretty ruthless, obviously. I mean, you don't become the best player in the world if you're not ruthless and competitive and, and highly skilled. She brought home four medals from four Olympics and carried the Australian flag in London. That was the most amazing thing ever, and I actually just can't remember what I was feeling at the time. It was so euphoric. I was so euphoric. Lauren Jackson ploughed on through a cascading series of injuries. Hip, shoulder, broken ankle, fractured back. But it was her knee that got her in the end. My knee just turned to mush. The bones were soft, I suppose you would say, and I couldn't actually get back from it. It was the universe's way of telling me it was all over and um, the doctor sort of said to me, you've got no chance, your knee's not going to do it. And I just broke down, I was in tears and that, um, that feeling is something that, you know, it's, I'll never forget but yeah, I couldn't do any more so. To say goodbye to my love, what was my life, <laughs> my identity which is so heavily wrapped up in basketball, you know, this hurts. It hurts a lot. But as she retired, Lauren Jackson was harbouring a secret. Her injuries left her dependent 
on a cocktail of prescription medication. There are high stakes, you're getting paid a lot of money to perform and when you're a franchise player or someone that is expected to perform day in, day out, you, you do what you have to do to get by and for me that was painkillers, you know, and sleeping pills generally because, you know, after games I'd be in so much pain that I'd want to go to sleep and so, yeah. So, anyway, you, you just sort of get in a cycle and I think for me, um, and then especially with the knee surgery, z multiple, um, I was just in so much pain and then rehabbing it. Oh, my God, it was just a nightmare. So, yeah, having to get off everything um, was really, really, really hard. She went home to her parents to detox. What medication were you on? Like, oh, do you really want to know? It, I don't even... I was on a lot of stuff. And, I mean, to be honest, I really don't want to even talk about what I was on publicly. But it was, it was enough to make me go... Like, I, I had to stop, otherwise I, I could have ended up just like anybody else who's had a really tough time getting out of the sport. It wasn't just coming off the drugs. It was also the physical side effects athletes experience when they stop playing elite sport. They're going almost through a chemical withdrawal and in many ways you could probably liken it to coming off something like cocaine. So when you're actually engaged in physical exercise and movement, it can be very emotionally stabilising because it brings up the serotonin, brings up the dopamine. When you do it as part of a team in a group, brings in the oxytocin. They're all feel-good neurochemicals that actually help stabilise mood, but they also help with concentration and learning and memory. So the athletes can all of a sudden find themselves highly emotionally dysregulated, like anxious, struggling with depression as a result of this chemical change. The crashing part, the depression part, it's... That, for me, was the hardest part to deal with. Like, I had to go on antidepressants for periods of time through my career because it was difficult to readjust, to readjust to life. What about in terms of the support network that you had around you and suddenly, do you it's have gone. anything? <laughs> You know, the people that really pushed me to get to the highest levels, like, I haven't heard from anyone. I'm sure if I called Basketball Australia and said, I need a job, I need help, I need something, help me, I'm sure that they would help. Like, there's no doubt in my mind. Um, was there any structure in place leading into my retirement? No, there wasn't. Lauren's right. There, there, there is no structure in place. Um, there wasn't when she retired. There still isn't. And, and that's not good enough. We need to support our elite talent both on the, on the court, off the court, when they're in the team and when they're not in the team and as they're transitioning. For us to be able to build that structure over the next three to five years, that's an absolute priority for our business. Lauren Jackson's saviour was a baby boy. Harry was born in February this year. such a good little boy. He's the best thing that ever happened to me because I could quite well have... Who knows? I, I don't even want to think about what could have happened to me. Lauren Jackson and all of the athletes we spoke to say their sports can do much better to prepare young people for the brutal shock of life after sport. The government puts in a lot of money into making us as finely tuned as possible so that we can win medals at Olympic Games, World Championships and things like that. So it's a bit like being put out to pasture when you retire. You just sort of, all right, we're done with you now. Go on, on your way. There has to be just a little bit more support through that process. Jackson also has a message for young athletes embarking on their careers. I wish I could say to another young athlete, it's going to stop, it stops really quickly, it ends. You need to find yourself, find out who you are. Now, do it. You can watch this program on iView or our website. Go to abc.net.au forward slash four corners. If the material covered in this story has raised any issues of concern for you, 
you can contact one of these services 